For Poetry London and Radio Western, this is Kevin Heslop in conversation with poet and essayist Emma Healy, who, alongside Jason Dixon, will read in London on September 18th from her most recent collection of prose poems published in the spring of 2018 by the House of Anansi Press and entitled Stereo Blind. Uh, Emma, early in the book, which you've described as elliptical, you seem to forecast its structure with the phrases, a spell about the present with the past and future in it and a curse about the future with the past and present in it. Shortly thereafter, we have the phrase, I'm writing a very elaborate palindrome. Reading this work, I was reminded by a technique in Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse-Five, a novel born out of the author's rupturing experience of the Dresden bombings whose protagonist finds himself unstuck in time, a feeling your collection often evokes. Time folds in on itself, and the reader, increasingly as the sequence unfurls, never knows quite where or how to put their foot on the ground. Last December, Hazlitt published a personal essay of yours about a concussion you suffered in Montreal several years ago, and I wonder whether to begin, and whether it's too much of a stretch to connect that rupture with the experience of time in, terio bl- in stereo blind that feels unstuck. Huh. You know, it's okay, this is actually very interesting, and I'm thrilled to be asked about it because it's something that I think about privately all the time. Um, but the concussion actually happened after this book had been published. Mm. It happened in Toronto um, last, almost exactly a year ago, actually. It's like a, a year and a, and a few weeks, I guess. Okay. Um, and it was really funny because I had, you know, I had just written this whole book. It had come out a few months earlier um, in which I had really been, you know, as you say, like really, really committing and digging down into this uh this idea and this feeling and this theme, which felt like such an overarching, uh, like it was just so consuming to me, this idea of, of, yeah, time kind of like overlapping with itself or folding over on itself and the, the different ways in which that can play out in like the physical space around you and also just within your own body and your own experience of reality and things like that. Right. And I spent all this time thinking about it and, uh, and writing about it, and then I wrote the book, and the book came out, and I thought, oh, good, I'm, like, done thinking about that for a while, I guess, and then I got, I got a concussion, and concussion is basically all about, like, concussion recovery especially is basically all about those things. It's about managing those sort of themes and those ideas inside of your physical body and your emotional state, mm. and so it's funny because I, I, I felt like I had accidentally... Like, you know, I think that this often happens when you make art is that you you spend a lot of time thinking about a particular subject. And then when you finish making the product, you're like, wow, I guess my relationship with this thing is done for a while. And then often I find that it turns out that the book is like the beginning of your relationship with the idea and Mm -hmm. not the end. You sort of play yourself in that way. Um, And I feel like that's what happened to me. (laughs) Um, I mean, another, I guess, way that... um that there's a sort of confluence between time and meaning um, would be maybe deja vu and also synchronicity. Um, yeah. And I wonder whether um, either of those two terms, deja vu or synchronicity, hold much weight for you either regard with regards to this work or, um, or personally or with regard to future work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think deja vu was definitely, it was a more like prominent, I had some, some poems about where I was sort of thinking about that concept and and looking into it um, more that ended up getting cut from the book because they just weren't, they felt almost a little bit too obvious to Mm -hmm. me or they felt, they felt a bit too like, like not, they would be an interesting like conversation topic, but maybe not as interesting of a poem, but it is something that I'm very interested in because no one really, I mean, no one really knows what it, is Mm -hmm. exactly um you know there's all these different scientific theories about like you know that if you're if you're it's like a little synaptic glitch where your brain kind of like misfires for a second or that it's like a it's a coping mechanism or it's your it's like reshuffling you know a memory that doesn't belong somewhere into a new into a new space but again i think that's that's all stuff that can happen i think in in moments of uh, like this, this book I think is all for me about sites of, um, 
yeah, feeling the feeling the past and the present sort of shuffled into each other in that same way, or looking around you and feeling like completely like you've come untethered from like the present moment mm. when you realize that you could be in any year in any like you know particular time of your life and there's so many different things that can cause you to have that feeling like extreme like joy and happiness can give you that feeling also like trauma and depression can really like you know mm. it's like a feature of those things that they sort of skip you into that feeling um like like trauma especially is often like a site of repetition in that way mm. and so I did become very interested in deja vu because it's basically just a different way of classifying a similar a similar problem right like it's a it's a different angle to look at the same thing that I was very interested in so I'm I'm fascinated by all of this stuff mm. and the more you think the more you think about it the less <laughs> <laughs> the less understandable it becomes, mm -hmm. really. Like the 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 fewer answers you have. I also I I not to get too um like elliptical too early on or anything. Mm -hmm. Feel free. But um, <laughs> but I, you know, something that was really interesting to me when I was recovering from that concussion is that uh, so much of the stuff that you have to do when you're recovering from a brain injury, um, or at least a mild one like I like I had, is um, the same stuff that you are asked often to do when you're dealing with like a like a mental health mm. thing like depression or anxiety and in sort of recovery from trauma as well. And I I found myself really noticing the extreme similarities between the way the things that I was doing to heal my like physical brain like mm. the actual literal organ of my brain and the things that I had been trying to do you know for like a good chunk of my life to heal what I had thought of as these like sort of like emotional or to like handle these like more intangible emotional things mm. um and I feel like deja vu is another one of those it's a sort of it's a place where those two, those two categories melt together. It feels like an emotional experience, but it could also just be like a completely physical. It could be like an issue with the, the motherboard, with the processing equipment. Hmm. Um, and I feel like when you have a when you have an experience of something that is sort of both of those things at once, it's a really like fertile place to get uh, poetry from. Hmm. Um, so on this topic of feeling untethered and um yeah maybe sort of unstuck in time um we're having a conversation now about a book that was completed in in print a year and a half ago um and yeah. i suppose that you've not only been giving readings from but discussing this work for that period of time at least um yeah. and so i wonder if there's a sense there as well of um of of not quite having landed yeah. in the moment, something like this. Absolutely. And, you know, I think that um, there's an interesting, not to, not to keep coming back to this, but when I, so that when I actually got the concussion that I got, the, the reason why, the, the way that it happened, it was not like a cool sports accident or anything. It right. was that I was cleaning up cat pee in the basement of my house, which has a very low ceiling. And I was actually kneeling down. I thought that maybe the, the cat had peed on a box of this book, of the copies that I had oh. gotten from the publisher of this book. And I was kneeling down to check if they were okay. And then I stood up too fast and I hit my head. And that was when it happened. And then I've been thinking a lot about that, that exact moment and that particular time in my life because um, it happened in mid-August. And I've been finding that I've, I have a really clear, almost startlingly clear memory of like every day in late August through like October of mm. last year, because each day was marked by, you know, this really specific and small set of like symptoms and activities that mm -hmm. I had to just sort of do over and over again. Um, and so, and I live in the same house and a lot of the thing, I work at the same day job and a lot of the other things in my life are the same. And so I think that, I think that when you're, when you're, when you have a book and when you're like touring it and talking about it, you already feel a strange feeling of like you're, mm. you know, it's like wearing, wearing 
like a costume of yourself almost because you're mm. you're finished writing it but you're still talking about it as though you're like in process with the idea mm. but doing that coupled with um the fact that i i have such a strong memory lately of like this exact time in the recent past of my life and it feels almost like i can i can sort of switch between my memory of the thing and the present my present experience of those things so handily because they're so similar um, it's a very uncanny sensation, and it is the exact feeling that I was talking about in the book. So the whole thing just becomes like just a just a just a tremendous mess. Mm. <laughs> um, so about the book, I've read that you said that you wanted um, the exact kind of control that you did not have for each of your poems to be haunted by a brilliant, omniscient author whose shimmering attention fell all over the scenery like good light and that the work only got good when you stopped trying to control it so much. I can't help but think of that statement or those statements with regard to the, like, checking the, the box of books for the cat pee and then standing up immediately. Like, the, <laughs> yeah. there's so much of that that's, that's tied in there and also having to do with seeding control. Um, yeah. And I wonder about, I wonder if you talk a little bit about maybe your evolution as a writer, um, perhaps, um, from your undergrad to where you are now and whether that transition, that movement, that evolution has had to do with um, a kind of seeding control and maybe allowing a kind of synchronicity or deja vu or these these things that seem to want to pass through, um, pass through. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, it's, it's pretty funny that that happened in that exact, no one's ever pointed that out to me in exactly those terms, but you're 100% correct <laughs> that it's like, it's a very... The whole thing is just so literal. Mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. it's, it's a bit goofy. But, like, um, yeah, I think that, okay, so I, when I first, um, when I was young, I wanted to be a novelist. I read a lot of books. I grew up in a family full of um, people who love to read novels, and I thought that was literature. You read a novel, you write a novel. That's mm -hmm. the important, cool, good thing to do. And that, and it, it seemed like a, it seemed like a way it seemed like to me the ultimate way to like process and reflect reality was to fictionalize it in some way. Um, hmm. And then I, w I went to uh, I went to undergrad at a, a creative writing program um, at a university where I my whole goal was to like emerge from it with like a, an understanding of how I could write a novel. Basically, that hmm. was what I wanted to do. Um, and I I did not learn that there. Um, and in fact, I had a bunch of um, very, like a like a like a number of different types of um, quite disturbing experiences with like the with the concept of like mentorship and with like the people who are supposed to be teaching us how to write novels mm -hmm, specifically. Mm -hmm. um, and so instead, I I came to poetry um, where I found. Um, like a completely different way to think about and encounter language and also to sort of um, like reflect on and, and walk around and sort of like pace around in the idea of the self that felt um, like really wonderful and exciting and thrilling to me. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I, I suddenly, I swung all the way around. I was, I loved poetry and I was interested in poetry and I read poetry and that was, that was it for me. And then, but e even in my poetry, I think you can see in like my first book, um, I was very, very frightened about, um, or of like of speaking or writing in the first person about my, uh, you know, my personal experiences of the world. Mm. Um, that seemed to me to be like, I think that there was something left over of the instincts that I had originally had that like fiction was the ultimate way to, to talk about your experiences. Right. I thought that it was sort of like I think my natural inclination was that it was a bit like gauche to talk about yourself directly. When and did also, the personal essays start? The personal essays started um, after undergrad. Okay. I was writing literary criticism, um, or not like I mean, it's, I mean probably, but it was stretched to call it literary criticism. I was writing book reviews for the newspaper, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then I was. Uh, I was writing book reviews for the newspaper, and then I, uh, there was a book by a, a what, what, talk about recursion, there was a book by a woman named Emma Healy, uh, who was a novelist, um, who right. became quite famous, 
and her I started getting emails for her like people mm-hmm. would google her and find my name and send me emails congratulating oh me gosh. on my novel that's so bizarre <laughs> Isn't that wild? And I had, and I was literally, this started while I was at, um, I was at a writing residency, the first one that I had ever done, like coming to terms with the fact that I had no idea how to write a novel. And that part of what had, you know, part of the reason that that had happened was because I had had all these encounters in my undergrad with these, um, like older men and like male professors, especially who had really done a lot to encourage the idea that, um, it was like artless to write about yourself and Mm. that, um, there was sort of no that it was like gross, especially um, for for a, a woman to do that right. um, in a particular way. And so and so I was already sort of like wrestling with all of this different stuff. And then I started getting all of these emails that were like, "Congratulations on being a young, and incredibly <laughs> successful novelist." It's so weird. <laughs> yeah, like we're all so excited for you. What does it feel like to have everything you've ever dreamed of? Oh my and, gosh. And so I, I sort of freaked out, and I got uh, I started replying to the emails just as myself, um, and then I, I started putting those replies up on a blog because that's what you did in like the earlier two thousands. Two thousands, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and then my my editor at the National Post at the time, the book section at the National Post, was like, "Do you want to write an essay about this?" Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, no, 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 I don't write essays. I'll, I'll do an interview. I'll interview the other Emma Healy. And so we did an interview, but then I just ended up writing about the experience. And then that was the first, that was the first personal essay that I ever wrote. And it was quite a, it was like quite fun and surprisingly comfortable. And that was sort of my like dipping a toe into the, into the waters of like publicly speaking in the first person. That was Mm. when I started to become, I think, a little bit more comfortable with it and starting to, like, think about what else I could do. Okay, so so you begin the undergrad with an end in mind, namely a novel, (laughs) and then you end up with a book of poems entitled Begin with the End in Mind, and then interview someone called (laughs) Emma Healy about the novel that she had published that you've been receiving emails congratulating you about, and this is your first foray into writing a personal essay defying the... uh, the ostensibly gross um, first-person perspective. Okay, this is yeah. this is a yeah. hell of a way to begin. And then you, oh, so then you, yeah, you published this first collection of yeah. poems. Yeah. What, what was that like for you? What did that mean? That was, that was cool. It was just cool. It was so exciting. It was such a it was such an absolute thrill to do it. And then you know what? Let's just let's just get all the way into it. Sure. So the first the first book um, that I had written. Uh, the the first uh, book of poetry, Begin with the End in Mind, was published by a, a press in, out of Winnipeg called Arbeiter Ring, which at the time, um, my my editor there was a man named John K. Sampson, who was the, the lead singer of the band The Weaker Thans. I don't know if you've ever heard of them, mm-hmm. but they, they, they were my absolute favorite band wow. through like all of like junior high and high school. I was like obsessed with them and his writing had actually kind of, like, introduced me to, like, I think it was the first, like, real poetry that I had ever loved instead of just being like, huh, that's kind of cool. Mm-hmm. It was really, like, and, and so it was a real, like, just imagine the, the thrill of having someone that you, you know, like, idolized so intensely, like, like working with you on your book. It was oh just, like, God. I, yeah, I felt so, like, I just felt quite, honored to do it and I was so I don't know I can't think of a better situation for my first book to have come out with it was just like such a such a pleasure they were so wonderful to me so that was cool but it was also weird it was totally surreal it happened right at the end of my time in undergrad and then uh and then I like graduated school and I didn't really know what to do with myself I was like well I did that and this you know it's a lesson that every poet learns but it was a weird time to learn it uh that like publishing a book doesn't really change like it changes your your life and then you have a book published but it doesn't really yeah. you know then I then I went to work at a at, to do technical writing at a porn company so it didn't really it didn't right. really launch me into the stratosphere and that's in Montreal yes that was in Montreal yeah um one of the ways in which I've heard you discuss um, 
the sort of uncanniness that we were discussing earlier and that seems to be suffusing the conversation that's thus far um, was mm -hmm. in your having begun in Toronto and then gone to Montreal and then returned to Toronto and that yeah. there's maybe um, a sense of detachment and return to a place that felt like part of your past and so where are you in your own chronology? What, what did that move from Toronto, or from Montreal, rather, back to Toronto? Um, how did that influence your work or um, your consciousness, if I could put it as broadly as that? Yeah, I think it was, I mean, I think it was the engine for this book that we're talking about, pretty much. Like, mm -hmm. it was, um, I moved not just, I moved, well, when I first moved back, I was saying, I basically orbited the the neighborhood that I grew up in ever since I moved back here um, and not really on purpose at all it's just like a series of different like situations I've sort of tumbled into like these different housing situations where I, I live quite close to places that I you know like have very strong childhood memories of um, or you know my mother still lives in the house that I grew up in um, and and I live quite close to her and I have lived quite close to her since I since I moved back and so it's just mm. You know, I'm sure that, like, I know that everybody has this experience when they move, when they return to their hometown, I mm. think. Um, it just happens, I think, that I, I came back to live here. I never expected to do it, which added a sort of strange, um, you know, sort of self-centered, like, self-reflection to the walking around that I was doing the first couple of years that I lived here again. And then also... Um, Toronto is a you know every every neighborhood that I lived in when I was young has gentrified so rapidly and to the point of mm. almost being unrecognizable. unrecognizable right and and so there is also the very literal I mean it's kind of like the the emotional versus like physical reality distinction that I was talking about before like the 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 circuitry of your brain versus the more like intangible air of your like emotional state mm. i feel like toronto is a really like useful um concrete like example of that where there's the emotional like architecture of the city when you're walking around which mm. kind of feels like it's it's always sustained um like some very similar qualities and then also it's it's changing. It's changing really fast and it has been changing for a long time. And then there's also the literal physical architecture where you can see, you know, buildings that are, um, that you've known, you know, for, for years that are like implanted in your childhood memories, but they're like spliced with these completely unfamiliar brand new, um, like businesses and things like that. So it's just, mm -hmm. it all, it all feels quite continuous to me, mm -hmm. I think, and or it did, especially when I was writing this book, and I think it was sort of, I think if I hadn't moved to Toronto, this book would be quite different, or maybe it wouldn't have existed at all. Um, um, so I've just realized that we're at 23 minutes, and <laughs> we're, we're supposed to go for 30, so I'm wondering whether we can just kind of keep going, and then I think the radio station might be frustrated me, with me for not finishing this in 30, but I feel like there, there are too many good questions to ask remaining, if that's, that's okay with you. Listen, I love to talk, as you may have already noticed, so I am, I'm down. Let's do it. Sweet. Okay, so there's a, there's a line by Virginia Woolf that I wanted to bring in. Um, Rigid, the skeleton of habit alone holds up the human frame. Um, mm. I was thinking about, the habit, about habit um, and the sort of habitual ceremony of writing as um, um, something that's contrary to, opposite to um, that sense of unstuckness. Um, and one, I was wondering whether writing, that sort of ceremony of writing, has functioned in a way um, as, a, as a means to kind of return to... I don't want to say the present moment because it feels like the present moment has expanded beyond p past and, and future in a way. But mm -hmm. um, so that's that's a clustered way to, to offer the question. But um, how do you, yeah, do you no, feel like I, writing I, is a way a means by which to return to some sense of something? I'm not sure. You can you're, you're no, more eloquent I, I, than me. No, I'm I'm not. A, <laughs> a, B, I I think that you're I think that you're um, I see what you're saying and it's. I regret to say that I, I think that maybe especially being concussed has really um, scrambled my thinking on this point. Like I was already, I was always like a bit of a, like a like a kind of petulant. Like I don't know. I think that writing 
like being able to write and especially being able to write like for any any audience beyond yourself um mm. and and making like any amount of money off of it at any time it is like such a crazy privilege um sure. and i and i do feel i do get pleasure out of it sometimes but it's not a pleasurable activity for me it's always been quite fraught mm. um and like and like a like quite an anxious activity and I was never quite able to put my finger on what the problem was with it until I became concussed um and one of the things that they told me um early on in the recovery when I was supposed to be resting my brain a lot they they told me um not to get uh anxious or use my memory too much because those were the two things that uh burned up like your brain processing energy um three times as fast as like any other type of thought that you could do basically right. So it's um, and you're also the supposed to, process. yeah, exactly. And you're also supposed to stay away from screens. So oh, it, I felt I was like, oh wow. So the thing that the thing that I do, like writing, is literally just all three of those things simultaneously. <laughs> and and you know, like I I had always thought of it as I was like, it must be like a like a flaw that I can't feel good when I'm writing that I don't like enjoy the feeling of doing it. But then I, I sort of, I was thinking about it in those terms, um, and I, I realized that a lot of, I think especially if you're a person who deals with anxiety specifically, mm. um, I think that often the act of writing is like you sort of like conjuring or like enacting a lot of habits that like in the rest of your life, you're working very hard to try not to do, mm. which is like dwelling on something for a really long time. <laughs> And, like, kind of trying to, like, circle it from, from like, you know, all possible angles and to to envision, like, every outcome and, and things like that. Mm. Um, and, uh, and, you know, like, in the rest of my life, I, I try very hard to, like, manage and control those things. And so I think writing has always felt to me, like, maybe even a slightly dangerous um, and, like, stressful thing to want to do and to be trying to do all the time because you're sort of, like... You know, you spend the rest of your day engaging in habits um, to try and, like, you know, tamp that stuff down. And then you sit down at your desk and you're like, all right, time to time to bring it all back up mm -hmm. again. Which is, um, you know, it's, it's maybe not the most intuitive thing to do, at least for me. I heard a line recently uh, that a writer is someone for whom writing is more difficult than it is for others. Ha. I don't know. I think I like, I mean, that makes me feel better, but I think that there are also plenty of people who really enjoy, I think that something nice about, as I get older, um, not, like, I, I, I do find comfort in times when I hear people talking about their philosophies about, about the act of writing and uh, things like that, and I, and I find, I can find something to relate to, mm. but I also, I'm trying to embrace more and more the idea that, like, it's just a completely different thing for everyone who does it. Mm -hmm. um, and it that sort of makes me feel better because it means I don't have to compare myself to anybody to check if my experience is correct or not. That's, I think, where I'm trying to land yeah. with it. Here, here. Um, just to appease the radio station, I'm going to pretend to conclude this conversation with an outro, and then we can just kind of return to it in case they want to splice this into two parts, okay? Fantastic. For Poetry, London, and Radio Western, this has been Kevin Heslop in conversation with poet and essayist Emma Healy, who, alongside Jason Dixon, will read in London at Landon Library for Poetry London on, se on September 18th at 7 p.m. Um, okay, so part two, I suppose. Um, in a past interview, you mentioned how the experience of being featured in the work of friends and fellow artists afforded you a view of yourself you wouldn't have had otherwise, and that that parallax contributed to your sense of identity to some extent and uh -huh. i wonder whether uh, stereo blind which as I mentioned earlier um had been completed in, in print for about a year and a half now i wonder whether you can see that book as a document of a person who is similarly both yourself and not yourself as if from a similar perspective once removed and i wonder whether how that distance informs your current sense of self or artistic identity does it feel like an artifact of someone else in the same way that other people artists friends of yours including you in their work had ever felt is there some similarity huh. there yeah i think for sure and i think that um again i don't want to generalize but i do think that um 
so so my two my two best friends in the world are um, one of them is a an actor and one of them is a musician and so we're we're all kind of always comparing our experiences of like trying to bring your own identity into the the project or like just mm-hmm. where your sense of self lands in the project that you're currently working on and mm-hmm. like how much you choose to put of yourself in it and why um, and and so we talk about this a lot and I I think that at least with them. I've noticed that we all kind of have this similar feeling of like, <laughs> okay, now Go ahead. I, this is, this is kind of, this is kind of gross, but I, okay. I once, I once heard that like the reason why, um, you're, you, we're like, uh, you can become squeamish about like blood or like spit or vomit or things like that is because you're seeing something that is supposed to be like inside of you and suddenly it's outside of you. Ah, interesting. <laughs> And so that's like, how you that's respond not... to your own sense of your your own work, like seeing your own. Yeah, uh... yeah, pretty much. <laughs> okay, <laughs> where, interesting. Where you're like, it's like it's 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 absolutely like of you, and you right. know that, and you re- you remember the pro. It's, I'm using a lot of bodily metaphors now, but it's also I think it's a bit like, I mean, it's a bit like how after you you have a child, I think your brain is supposed to make you forget how painful it was so that you can eventually want to do another one someday. Right, right. And I, I think that when you, I think that like when I was like, I remember the process of writing this book and it was like torturous. Like yeah. I just, I was miserable working on it a lot of the time because I just felt like I was trying to stab at this thing that kept escaping me. I felt like I would come to it, you know, every day and like, you know, Yesterday, I had, like, learned the password to open the door, and then today I would try to key in the password, and it would be a totally different thing, and then I would spend the whole day, like, trying to find the new one. Right. And, like, but now when I remember that, I'm like, oh, what a, you know, like, I still remember it as this kind of, like, rosy, like, like almost innocent or naive thing compared to the book that I'm working on now, which, of course, is, like, the real work that is, like, of my soul and like you know the most Mm. serious thing that I've ever done and like blah 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 and then you know I'm gonna see that that way in like a year and a half from now or whatever like I think it I think that um every time you make a work of art you're sort of like making a weird little snapshot of yourself that then you have to carry around with you for the rest of your life Mm. and it's like you know it's it's about you but it's not about you what a long answer to a short question (laughs) well I mean you know now that we have another half an hour, please yeah. feel feel free at liberty to 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 go as long as you. I mean, um, or maybe like a tattoo. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, where the the meaning of it, there's a part of the meaning of it that stays fixed hmm. um, to you, and and you know, there's a part of it that's always the same thing, um, and it's about you, and it's it's on you, and it's of you, but it's not. It also feels like someone else's decision. Right, right, right. So, and the piece that you're working on now feels very consciously you, the decision yeah. of, of the person that you are at this moment. Yeah, but even now, I mean, I'm having that experience again because I just finished this. This, I mean, I finished like the big draft of this other book, and I, I sent it off. And literally, like the day that I sent it off, I could feel it. I could feel the like, the sense that it was, you know the most important and, like, all-consuming, like, thing about me sort of leaving my body a little wow. bit and wow. being replaced with, like, a different feeling, which is the feeling that, like, oh, I did that, which is a much lighter and easier feeling to right. carry around. I think it's almost like a survival mechanism that you can make that switch. Yeah, yeah, the oxytocin floods in, and you're like, oh, that was okay. That wasn't so bad. I yeah, yeah, I could totally do that again. No problem. Um, I remember... There's a, a line that is attributed to uh, Laurence Olivier, um, I offer in the context of both your parents having been. Are they still actors? Yeah, 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 yeah. They're more, they're more playwrights now. Okay. Um, they still act. So he was asked um, uh, what his favorite part about being an actor was, and he said the drink afterwards. <laughs> um, and I wonder, similarly, whether you prefer the experience of writing or having written. Oh, having written, absolutely. <laughs> and I, I kind of think that, I mean, it's not, again, like, I've, I've enjoyed writing in the past, and I would say about once every, like, year or maybe every, like, 16 months, I'll have, like, an experience of it that feels, like, 
pleasurable enough and like wonderful enough that it sustains me until the next one happens of like just like loving doing it and feeling like I'm so just like in the moment and like in you know just like in the pocket with it Mm -hmm. um but then the rest of it you know who doesn't who doesn't love you know presenting your thing Mm -hmm. and and having people look at it and talk to you about it versus you know, sitting alone in a room, like thinking your thoughts over and over again. Right, I think right. that that's that for me is pretty much a, a no brainer. And you like reading. Yeah. Yeah. I like reading. I like talking, obviously. <laughs> I'm like, a, I'm like a pretty, I'm a decently social person for someone who also spends like a lot of time alone. Like I, right. I, 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 and it, it just makes you feel better to have, the things that you've been thinking about be like exposed to the air of like other people's attention i mm, think mm, it's just it makes you feel like there's a point mm. for me at least um i remember robin williams describing himself as a site-specific extrovert <laughs> that's good i like that that's excellent yeah I that. yeah yeah i think that's exactly right um Well, let's see. Um, sorry, give me a second here. No worries. Take your time. Okay, so this is a question that I tried to formulate, and I don't know if I succeeded, but I'm just going to sort right. of blunder into whatever I... There's a line in Forced Swim... Um, that Mm -hmm. caught me off guard uh, and which I think applies to the line of thought having to do with um, with sort of being unstuck in time and um, that sense of sort of disorientation and perhaps connected with um, a kind of depressive disposition Uh, it's contrary to what I've heard in your the tones of your voice from the other side of the phone at the moment but um, the lines um, the great trick it is, yeah, that's right. <laughs> after after we talked, I started reading this article called "Can Bacteria in Your Gut Explain Your Mood?" I've always been interested in the different ways in which I am responsible for my own sadness. Changing a patient's bacteria, the article said, might be difficult, but it still seemed more straightforward than altering his genes. The poem goes on to describe a means of testing the effectiveness of antidepressant drugs in which laboratory mice are forced to swim in a water-filled cylinder until they give up and, quote, collapse in a forlorn float. The amount of time it takes for a mouse to give up is a way to measure what they call behavioral despair. And um, in a stroke, we have maybe the implicit suggestion that depression is the fault of those who suffer it, connected with the article's use of an arbitrarily gendered pronoun, and I wonder whether the maybe depressive, unstuck state that we discussed earlier might be a natural response to the state of the world around us at the moment, as opposed to it being something that's um, the result of a kind of internal chemistry. Yeah, I mean, that's always, that's always the question, right? Like, it's, it's, I, at least for me personally, um, you know, as a, as a person who is, depressed certainly and who has been depressed I think for longer than like I certainly longer than I as I think a lot of depressed people are like much longer than I understood that that was what was going on with me or that you know than that I had like terms to articulate it Hmm. um I think they say before it was a thing these days yeah exactly before (laughs) it was a thing I feel like I feel like um you know it's maybe for me, it's always been a question that feels very important. Um, maybe, maybe in a practical sense, it isn't important at all. It doesn't matter. Mm. Um, but it, it has always felt to me like it matters very much to determine, um, you know, how much of, and again, like right back to concussion stuff and like the, the, the physical circuitry that produces yourself versus all the, like, weather that hangs around you that feels kind of like it doesn't have to do with that. Like, and the impressions that the outside world makes on you versus the, the stuff that's going on inside your body. Just, like, trying trying to, to test and track endlessly mm. which of those things is causing what feeling or behavior um, inside of you. And, like, you know 
I think ostensibly the reason why I have, I can be so like focused on that question um, is that, uh, you know, you want to know how to fix it. If it's the outside world, then like, you know, you can insulate yourself from the outside world. If it's mm-hmm. other people's perceptions of you, then you can, you know, modulate your response in some way. If it's, the bacteria in your gut, you can take probiotics. If it's your, you know, they, I think there's <laughs> there's like a long list in that poem of like different different things that you know you can try to do right. to try and and fix your your depression, and they all kind of have to do with like trying to slide around all these little tiny factors inside of your body and like out and 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 that then there's all these things that happen outside of you that you have absolutely no control over and that you can't do anything about at all. And those two things are often very hard to reconcile with each other. Like neither of them really has an answer for the other. Or I think that there's maybe something in like contemporary um, culture that wants you to constantly turn inward to try and fix the problem. Right. (laughs) When I think as you suggest, like there's, you know, you can you can have those feelings of despair for reasons that have nothing to do with how well you're taking care of your body. Right. Um, and that, it, and that especially when you're someone that the world reads is like not male, um, the, the burden of, you know, fixing that stuff for yourself when so often it's external circumstances that are visited upon you, um, mm. that, that are making it worse. Right. I think that's a, that's a real sort of like bind that I, you know, I have found myself in, but that I think a lot of people find themselves in to, to varying degrees. Huh. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, um, obviously depression and anxiety are, their rates are sort of um, historically un- unprecedented, either in their um, declaration or their documentation or in actuality amongst maybe our generation and the generation especially to follow us. And I wonder whether that's not about um, much else besides the fact that, you know, the sort of the world's on fire at the moment. Um, yeah. You know? It's, it's, I mean, yeah, that's a, that's a huge question. This, you know, it's a big one in my household, I feel. And in like pretty much everyone's right now is mm-hmm. like, you know, how, how, how much of it can you, like how much of it is a, I, I remember, um, have you read the book 1004 by Ben Lerner? Oh, um, I haven't, but I heard him speak about it on a couple of occasions. There's a part in that book where he talks about, he, there's a scene where he's sitting in his office for like, uh, like office hours as a professor. Mm. And, and a man comes in who's obviously having like a, like kind of a breakdown of some kind. Um, and who is, is giving him this like long and sort of protracted speech that, that sounds maybe like, like a, like a, it sounds manic. Like he's, Mm. he's talking about, you know, that he's being maybe like tracked by people or that there's, you know, there's poisons in the water that are like affecting his mental state, et cetera. And he, the, you know, the narrator of the story kind of takes a step back and he thinks about it and he's like, but don't I also think that all of these things are true (laughs) to a certain degree? Like, don't I feel as though I'm being constantly monitored by like, you know, the government and enormous corporations? Don't Mm -hmm. I feel that there are like poisons leaching into the water supply and into the ground and, you know, all of those things? Like, you know, what's the, what's the difference really between the way that I feel about these things and the way that this person feels about these things? And why am I reacting in this way? Um, when a person is like presenting these concerns to me, which I think is like a, you know, that's a, that's a question that has gone from being like a kind of niche, like, like literary, poetic, like political concern, I think in recent times to being like quite a mainstream Mm. question and like topic of conversation among people. And I think the more you think about it again, as with everything else that we're talking about, the more you think about it, the less answerable the question becomes. Mm. Um, so you mentioned that you had your sort of, you know, almost surreally dream editor, um, this bizarre kismet opportunity with, uh, begin with the end in mind. And I wonder yeah. if you'd offer a word about working with, uh, Kevin Connolly on Stereo Blind. Oh, 
Kevin is the absolute best. I mean, anyone who's ever worked with him or, or been his student will tell you he is the, the best editor in Canada. He's the best poetry editor possibly anywhere. Like, he's wow. just, he's absolutely brilliant. He's so supportive. He's so thoughtful. He's so kind. And he's so matter-of-factly engaged with the task of turning your work into like exactly what it is supposed to be. He is not concerned at all with making it what he thinks like a good poem sounds like. Mm. He's he becomes uniquely and I think you can see this in like pretty much every book that he's ever edited. You don't you don't feel that there's like a like you don't read a book and pick it up and think like, oh Kevin edited this mm. because you know, his voice is kind of like all over or you can like see his like influence what you can see is like the the clarity of like voice and vision mm-hmm. in, like a person's like in the individual's work is just like completely brought to the fore i think that's like it's such a unique quality in an editor of any kind but especially i think in in editors of poetry because i think often poetry editors tend to be other poets right. um and, and it's sort of a natural thing to bring your own um like preconceptions and and aesthetics and and stuff like that i think that no matter how hard you try you sort of do end up doing that a lot of the time um but uh yeah kevin is just the he's the absolute best he's wonderful yeah wonderful tribute um the image that was coming to mind was of somebody who's like distilling a variety of different kinds of spirits like evaporating (laughs) excess water or something to like purify them something like this yeah yeah yeah. How does that like? Um, so you you bring a poem, say, uh, yeah. from Stereo Blind to him. Uh, could you give me like a literal step by step of how that pr- <laughs> does it work like that? Yeah. Yeah, I can because I think that the way that we did it was maybe a bit unusual even for him, um, and he was quite patient with me throughout the process. I think that normally the people that he works with. Um, just like because of the the nature of the publishing industry and I think also because he often works with people who have like written their books you know they're either like professionals who have basically finished writing their book um or people who wrote it you know like like um Nico Harvey one of the other poets who had a book come out with an Nancy at the same time as me had completed his book like in an MFA program so I think that's what happens a lot of the time whereas I had a manuscript that was like half finished maybe Um, and he read it and, and liked it enough to work with me on the rest of it. And Mm. so basically I would send him, this was very funny. And I don't know if he does this with everybody, but it was, it was a hilarious and delightful process to me where I would email him like about once a week, I would say I would email him like two new poems and then he would mail me back a physical marked up copy (laughs) Wow. Where, like I would get it in the in the paper post. I would get an envelope with his notes on on the things that I had written, and he would you know he would send me a little email to say like I got them, like you're gonna hear back from me soon. But that was cool. basically how he did. He like wrote the whole book by correspondence, kind of, which was absolutely wonderful for me. I'm I, I'm sure that it was. I don't know if you talk to him about the process, then maybe it was a bit more stressful for him. He did tell me at the beginning that he had never done a book exactly that way before. Um, but I loved it. I had a great time. It was wonderful for me. And I, I think I never would have, I think that without that, without his encouragement and without the like impetus to sort of keep doing it forever or no, like not forever, but for a fixed amount of time, I would have just kept writing like the same two poems forever. I don't think that I would have finished this book if it wasn't for, um, having been able to work with him in that way. Right. He's sort of holding you accountable to continue to produce new work within a a sort of enigmatic deadline. Yeah, absolutely. And I think as you can maybe tell from this conversation, like if you if you give me enough time, I will continue to just spin around on a single topic forever. And so it was really good to have somebody sort of like keeping me keeping me focused on moving forward. That was important, I think. Okay. Um well, in that case, I will offer a, a nice decisive question that's different from what I've asked earlier um in the interest of it keeping has. us moving forward. Um uh, in anticipation of my asking you to read a poem from Stereo Blind in a moment, I wonder um, with what would you like an audience to your reading 
to arrive and with what with what would you hope they depart oh boy honestly um it's it's nice when anyone comes to a poetry reading at all what a tremendous gift what a what a what an enormous favor you are doing to a poet right. when you so you simply <laughs> hope that they arrive not forgetting what yes. they arrive with yeah exactly right. it's honestly as 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 long as you're as long as you're not throwing things i'm good to go and even if you are throwing things it depends on the thing right. but <laughs> but um i don't know i think honestly um <laughs> Wow, I'm really setting the bar extremely low. If you, if, when someone leaves a poetry reading that I've done, my ideal state for them to be in is like not annoyed, <laughs> not okay. feeling like I've like wasted their time, basically. Because I do think that it can be, you know, I think that um, again, as as I've demonstrated here, like poets can poets like to go long, um, myself included, and I try I I try to be respectful of everybody's. Um, attention. It's just so. It's just so nice to be able to do it. I always feel so lucky that people are there, and so I want to sort of like reciprocate. Um, you know, I want to like demonstrate that I'm that I'm grateful by not uh, making it a terrible time. For okay, everybody. well, let me Emma see if I can hold you accountable here. As opposed to having them negate a negative emotion, I wonder if you could offer a positive emotion that they might leave with. So. <laughs> Is that too much um, to ask? It's much. It's much harder. Um, I don't know. It'd be nice if they like it. Okay. <laughs> and what would liking it mean? If they feel, um, I don't know. Like my okay. Here's what I feel like I can do for you with okay. this question. My my favorite feeling, um, when I leave a reading, mm. is if I want to go out for a beer with my friends afterwards and talk for like two hours yeah. about the thing that we just saw and heard that's it that's what i like if it makes you think about things that you were already thinking about maybe slightly differently or if it makes you think about things that you weren't thinking about at all but that now suddenly you're very interested in um if it yeah if it makes you if it like evokes in you a strong feeling of any kind i feel like then then you're then you're golden you're good to go that's an evening well spent there you go excellent um, I gl I'm glad I pressed that point. I would wonder. I was wondering if you'd read a uh, a poem um, from Stereo Blind for us to to conclude. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm going to read the first one in the book, okay. which uh, it doesn't have a title in the book, but in my mind, it's always just been called autobiography. Um, okay. Our daughter came out haunted. Right away, we knew. The doctors reached for her, but passed their hands through future half a cloud, weak signal and projection, left her shivering and would not look at us about it. Her right eye floated, flashing in her head. Stray laughter made her stutter at the edges. Probably we should have been more scared. Our friends would come to visit and we'd be like, check it out, somebody tuned the baby between channels. No one liked that one but us. Our daughter slept with one eye open, phosphorescent and floating one inch off the mattress. She blew out breakers down the block, crying her single, searing pitch. The eye was blue, impossible, and fixed on us. Why were we not more scared? At night, in shifts, we sat alone and watched her watch the dreams that passed across its surface, watched her rise and waver in their swells. The wall-to-wall -wall grew wild beneath our beds, and silence, too, breathed in and out between us. We knew she was deciding. It was time to make our case. One night, when Michael was out buying groceries, I gathered my courage and the small pile of index cards upon which I had written my notes. In our bedroom, I stood up as straight as I could in the strange light of her and began my speech. I told her the truth about everything, about the two of us without him, about the debt and guilt and how it never stopped. I told our daughter how it felt to fake an orgasm, to cry at lost cat posters until a stranger asks if you're okay, to crave the same aloneness that will kill you. I told her I had long felt shadowed by a terrible sense of premonition, as though my life had been a string of petty crimes I was just waiting to be caught and punished for, that, in a sense, I was correct. For me, 
our daughter hovered steady, apparent. I could hear the key in the front door, Michael's shoes on the carpet. I had finished with my notes and could not stop talking. I wanted to make sure I got it all. That was Emma Healy reading from her collection Stereo Blind, which was published in the spring of 2018 by House of Anansi. Um, Emma with Jason Dixon will be reading for Poetry London on September 18th at 7 p.m. at Landon Library in London, Ontario. And uh, Emma, it has been an absolute delight and a pleasure and a privilege and an honor and multiple other things um, to have been able to speak with you um, for as long as Thank we have. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, this was great. Thank you. Take care. Okay, you too. Bye.